sure about following that. I suppose we'll give it a shot. I am very thankful for the opportunity to be here this morning to share with you at Bethel. Um, I, my name is Reed Jones, by the way. For those of you that don't know me, um, and I've had the chance to share this ministry, the Mustard Seed Sessions, at a number of places, including most of the Mennonite churches in our area. I've shared at Jubilee and South Union, my home church, which is Oak Grove. Um, but I'm especially thankful this morning to be able to uh, share here at Bethel and that I could walk out my back door across the parking lot at the Church of God and be here um, pretty easily, which meant a few extra minutes of sleep for me this morning, which living in a house with two children under the age of five is nothing short of a godsend. But I would first like to, to, sh to begin and open this morning by sharing with you a quick story. In the summer of 2013, I received word that a musical acquaintance of mine, who was a gentleman I had done some session work um, for in the past, and somebody who I had some mutual musical friends with, I heard that he was selling his business, his house, and much of his occupational and musical possessions, and he was doing so at auction. So I made the short trek down into Champaign County to Terry Hut uh, to send him off and perhaps score a deal or two on some musical gear. So upon arrival, I made my way to the house and began perusing all the different musical equipment that he was planning on selling, some of which I had seen before, some of which was new to me. But the item that stuck out to me most that morning was the little guitar you see right here. Now, you see, I have a thing for old guitars, like a serious thing. Like, like it's a problem. Um, you should just ask my wife and she will gladly tell you that it is indeed a problem. And when I see an old guitar, I get extremely excited. Um, and I get even more excited when it's something I've never really seen before. Even if it's not something that's inherently valuable, I just love old guitars. And so I began to look at the little guitar. I mean, obviously it's, it's diminutive in its stature. It's very small. Um, it, this was small in its day, um, and it's certainly small by our modern day. American standards of what a guitar should look like, but I was instantly taken aback by the apparent quality of the materials and the craftsmanship of this particular antique. Like most things that was built over a hundred years ago, there was great care taken to ensure the longevity of this piece, and no corners were cut. It was made with unbelievable craftsmanship. Only the best materials were used, and the most carefully thought out plans were consulted, and indeed it was fearfully and wonderfully made by the hands of a master craftsman. Does that sound familiar? <laughs> but like with most things, time and experience takes a very heavy toll. To say this guitar was not in playable condition would qualify as the understatement of the century. This guitar's created purpose was forsaken for the fads of the day when the original bridge, which is this piece right here, um, that looked originally like this, was removed, it was repaired, and then a little banjo style bridge and a tail piece were added. Um, it was neglected and misused. The back was broken. Uh, the top had separated uh, from the sides. The top was caving in under the pressure of time and of use and it didn't have the appropriate support to withstand the, um, the use it was being used for. To put it plainly, this guitar was a mess. Again, sound familiar? And so a long story short, I purchased this guitar for $70, and I set out to have it restored to its intended purpose. I had no desire for it to be clean, shiny, or, or perfect, but I wanted it to play like its maker had intended, all the while still bearing the scars of its story. Again, sound familiar? I love how this guitar perfectly mimics our story as wayward children of the Most High God. Lovingly restored to our created intent, made wiser by the scars of our youth, circumstances, and sometimes our poor decisions. But the spiritual metaphors of this guitar didn't really end there for me. So when I went to pick this up from the luthier that repaired it for me, I didn't really know what to expect. I mean, this guitar is extremely small. I'm used to playing much larger instruments, and it was nothing like what I was used to playing or hearing. So I anxiously took a seat on a stool, kind of like that, about 10 or 12 feet away from the luthier's counter, and I began to play it. It took a few minutes to figure out how to actually coax some tone out of it, but after a minute or two of noodling, I was very impressed with the results, and so I returned to the counter. I needed to, to pay for the work that was done. And the luthier said, man, it's unreal how that thing sounds out in front of it. 
And you see, if you play guitar, you'll know that it sounds very different when you play the guitar than it does to your audience out in front of it. What you're hearing and what they're hearing are never the same thing. It always sounds different out front. And my suspicions were confirmed by his comments. This guitar's voice did not match its size. It truly disturbed the air in a way that only instruments much larger um, normally do. And so as a, a testament to that, I'd like to take a second and I would like to play a medley of a couple of hymns on this small guitar to give you a, a reference point on its voice. Uh, I'd like to play Jesus Keep Me Near the Cross in Blessed Assurance.
God's kingdom is a very fascinating thing. And he used a lot of different words and parables to describe it. But this one resonates with me uh, most deeply, mainly because of my experience with this guitar. You see, the same all-powerful God who descended on Mount Sinai in a terrifying, dense cloud and whose glory filled the temple, the same God whose voice causes the mountains to tremble and fall into the sea, the same God who spoke the universe into existence, plants small, seemingly insignificant seeds, and brings forth powerful results. This is the kingdom of God, and it isn't out of character for God to do something that seems like foolishness to us. In fact, look at what we have recorded in the New Testament concerning the kingdom of God. Matthew has Jesus saying in chapter 18, verse 3, that we, we must change and become like little children or we'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. Matthew again, along with Mark and Luke, quotes Jesus as saying, Let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Now you can make what you will about what this means for the kingdom of God, but to me one thing is for sure. This is not the way I would expect the Almighty God of all that is to run His kingdom. The vision of the kingdom of this world, our unfortunate default, is one that is cast by the powerful, the rich, the haves, the ends, the strong, and those that have it all together, those that help themselves. Interestingly, Jesus says, Truly, I tell you, the tax collectors and prostitutes are entering the kingdom of God ahead of you. And he said this to his closest followers. And if anyone was supposed to have their spiritual lives together, I would think it would be the ones that the very Son of God chose as his confidants and disciples. And concerning the rich, Jesus says it is hard for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of heaven. Again, I tell you, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. All of this kingdom talk exists in a scriptural space that makes claims like the kingdom of God has come near. The kingdom of God has yet to come. It's not of this world, yet it is in our midst. And so with all the confusing, confusing things said about God and His kingdom, I believe a couple of things stand uncontested. First is that we must be born again to enter it. Jesus famously told uh, Nicodemus that no one can see the kingdom of God unless they be born again. Paul might say we must take off the old coat and put on the new. Either way, our default mode on earth is not oriented toward God without calling on Him to change that for us. And the second thing is an extension of the first. We are not building God's kingdom on earth if our kingdom work resembles the structures, the methods, and the ways so common to the kingdom of this world. They are indeed worlds apart, and this world desperately wants us to help in building its kingdom. Just turn on the radio or television, listen to any of the current presidential candidates pandering for our votes calling themselves, and this is a direct quote, great Christians, and espousing how their faith will make them better suited to lead this country, when in reality, they're living in the wrong world, hoping to build up the wrong kingdom. Jesus' kingdom is for the least of these. Mark records that anyone who wants to be first must be the very last, and the servant of all. Now all this flies in the face of what we hear from the world, and so I ask this morning, whose kingdom are we building? For we are all called to be about God's kingdom work, and warnings about failing to do so are numerous, including us being compared to trees that don't bear fruit, that are then cut down and thrown into the fire. So when I bring all these ideas about God's kingdom to bear on the parable of the mustard seed, I'm left with this. Regardless of our perceptions, God can do mighty works through us, for his kingdom. That guitar defied my expectations and it turned my musical world upside down and thus served as a reminder to the fact that Christ works the very same work in the hearts of people, flipping the expectations of kingdom upside down. The first shall be last, love your enemy. In order to find your life, you must lose it and on and on. It's not only espoused in the parable of the mustard seed, but this sits comfortably within the thrust of all of scripture. And so I felt led to use this guitar and my gifts 
in his service to plant a mustard seed of my own in the faith that God will give the increase. And so I suppose that's where you come in this morning. You see, I've arranged and recorded an EP of old hymns to be performed on. I've been speaking in churches on the parable of the mustard seed, performing a few songs on the guitar and selling those CDs. They sell for $10, uh, and, and thanks to a grant from Ohio Conference's ministry development team, all $10 go to support Aaron's ministry as chaplain at Adriel. My hope is to help her serve the kids at Adriel and plant the seeds that one day grow far beyond our expectations. She, she fills a need in the, in the lives of the youth at Adriel, and I hope that you'll consider buying one of these CDs to help her continue to minister. I'd like to play one more piece uh, for you before I wind this thing down. Um, and this is a song you may have sung as children, at least people in my congregation said they sang this more as children than as adults, but I think it applies nicely to Aaron's ministry. The song is called Jewels, and the words go something like this. When he cometh, when he cometh, to make up his jewels, all his jewels, precious jewels, his loved and his own, like the stars of the morning, his bright crown adorning, they will shine in their beauty, bright gems for his crown. He will gather, he will gather the gems for his kingdom, all the pure ones, all the bright ones, his love and his own. Little children, little children who love their Redeemer are the jewels, precious jewels, his loved and his own. And so I leave you with the song and with the question, whose kingdom are we building today? Now, as I play this last song, I will offer a quick disclaimer. I have to retune the guitar, and tuning a guitar that's 110 or 115 years old is not always that easy, so bear with me for a moment.
attention this morning. I'd like to just let you know that following the service, I, I have CDs available if you're interested in supporting uh, the ministry. I do have those available after the fact. But I would like to close in prayer. So would you bow your heads with me? Our Father, we are so thankful for this day. And though it is a cold morning, we are thankful for the changing of the seasons and the fact that we can see you in your world all around us. Father, I'm thankful for each one here this morning. And Father, I just pray that you would be with, with each one as we, as we ponder what it means to be about your kingdom work. God, we just pray you would impress upon each of our hearts a desire to serve you more fully, more deeply, Father, and a desire to, to build up your kingdom. And the faith, God, that, that you will provide the increase and that you will help your kingdom to grow far beyond all of our expectations and regardless of our shortcomings. Father, we pray this through the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, for his honor and his glory. Amen.